Sam, I'm glad you're alive. Me too. Yeah. Uh, you were going under the knife. And the drill. And the drill. Uh, a little bit of suction, even. Ooh. I don't know. I wasn't, th I wasn't hey, awake. Hey. I was mentally yo. not there. Get some fucking suction up in there. Um, you are less wizened than you were previously as yep. well. Yep. Uh, the wisdom teeth have been removed from Samuel's big fat skull. The final two thirds of the wisdom teeth, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wisdom score, nine now. <laughs> big penalty. We're in the negative one era now. But yeah, we're we're glad we're glad you're alive here. Um, I was never concerned about your actual survival, as dental surgery is kind of very tame, at least in America. Yeah, but now it, uh, you, you always have to have some caution when dealing with anesthesia. Mm -hmm. um, that's yeah, why you, anesthesiologists get paid lots of money. Oh yeah, you were out like a fucking light last night. <laughs> like it was, it wasn't even. It wasn't even close. Like I was like, oh well, you know, Sam went down for for a little napsy poo at like two o'clock after he got back. Yeah, Ma your mama brought you. It was yeah. very sweet. That must be nice. Um, the the joke there is that mine is is no longer with us. Well, my mom is very nice. Yeah, she is Shout very nice. Shout out to my mom. Yes, wonderful. And um, you went. You basically went to bed right after she left, and I checked up on you like a couple hours later, and you were like so just completely removed from this realm yeah you were completely out door wide open no no reaction to sound or light <laughs> in any way closed the door on you a little bit came in and checked on you about 15 minutes before we do our monday night magic live stream every monday where we play magic the gathering except for this week uh because sam was you were you your position hadn't changed <laughs> it was one of those where i was like do i check that you're breathing all right, the, I can see the chest rising and falling. We're good. I'm just going to close the door back again and get an early get an early bedtime to end my week. As I've got to work overtime tomorrow at work. And then we have... I work at a television station, and we're broadcasting um, the Reds opening day opening parade day, yeah. and stuff on Thursday. It's going to be a whole... It's going to be a whole week. Yeah, I, I don't go anywhere on Reds opening day. Yeah, it's... Because it's a shit show around here. It really is. It really, really is. It really, really is. Um... But we're not here to talk about the Cincinnati Reds and the start of the baseball season because we're not a baseball podcast. No. We are a Magic the Gathering and Dungeons and Dragons podcast. Indeed. Uh, number one in the greater Cincinnati area. We think. Probably. That would be really awkward if, if it wasn't. You, if you also have a Dungeons and Dragons and Magic the Gathering podcast and are in the greater Cincinnati area, let us know. We'll come fight you. Yeah, we'll fight you and we'll win. Once Sam is recovered. Once I'm, yeah. Once Sam Once is fully recovered. Once the side of my face is a puffy. Um, but of course, this is this is episode 63 of the Duels and Man of Dorks podcast. I'm Connor. And I'm Sam. And we are the Dungeon Bros, but we are not brothers. Nor are we in Dungeon. And this episode, episode 63, is sponsored. Um, we always do the joke sponsors, but we also have other ways that you can support us. Like uh, we did a little collab with Into the AM, Into the AM Graphic and Basic Tees. Uh, they're not really a podcast sponsor, but they've helped us out. And their link is in our bio uh, to get 10% off their Graphic and Basic Tees. I've been wearing their Graphic Tees uh, for the last several episodes of the podcast. They're quite comfortable. Yeah. Uh, Sam was sad because they only sent them in my size and I'm quite a bit larger than him. You are a large being. I'm a large being, uh, but they're wonderful. Check them out. Also, Tyler over at the Proxy Forge, who does Magic the Gathering tokens and proxies. Um, he's been he was on the TikTok shop for a long time. We've been doing a lot of stuff with him during our live streams. He's completely removed his stuff from the TikTok shop because he just has his own web page now. Yeah, uh, you can go there and you can order directly from him. He's always got a bunch of sales going on. If you use our link, that helps us out. It's a whole thing. And uh, that one guy who works uh, uh, for Uber in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Um, He's now a fan of the Dungeon Bros. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, one of my friends, he's uh, he's a swimmer at Arizona State University, and he is currently in Colorado Springs at the Olympic Training Center because we're getting close to Olympic trials for swimming. And uh, after after practice one night, he was taking an Uber to go to like dinner with some friends and was chit-chatting with the with the Uber driver who said he was a fan of D&D. &D. And, and my friend, knowing me and knowing the Dungeon Bros and what we do in our podcast, was like, hey... You should check out the Dungeon Bros. And then he was like, oh, my gosh, they sound so cool. And then he followed us on TikTok, apparently. Hell, yeah. And possibly is checking out our podcast as well. So if you're listening, please let us know. Thank you to that one guy who drives Uber in Colorado Springs and was turned on to us by one of his Uber drivers. Thank you for sponsoring this podcast. Thank you for sponsoring this episode of the Dungeon of the Duels and Man of Dorks podcast.
Anyway, um, we've had we've, we've been doing the bonus action series of podcasts as well, little extra episodes. Yeah, interviewing some recently, interviewing some of our friends throughout the uh, TTRPG creator space. Yes, uh, we want to get some Magic the Gathering people on. We're kind of waiting until uh, we get a little bit further into the spring. Summer starts begin, schedule starts opening up. Uh, but we also want we're, we're considering because this week. This week, mm. on Friday, two days after this podcast goes live on podcast services around the globe, um, we're going to be actually sitting down and playing Daggerheart. Yeah, the open beta. Uh, we got all the information you know, from that. We've watched the videos, and now we've decided it's our turn to yes. give them our opinion. Yes, Sam Sam will be running that game. I'll be playing in it. But uh, we're, we're looking into doing a bonus action of a bit of a deep dive into Daggerheart after we play it. Uh, possibly bringing one of our friends who played it with us on or uh, looking to see if one of our tabletop RPG friends is is playing it and having them onto the show and do a little three-way. Yeah. Ooh. Keep an eye out for that. So that'll be fun. Um, Sam, what have you been playing? <laughs> so actually, ye- uh, not yesterday, because yesterday I had my teeth removed from my head. Uh, but two days ago, went up to um, Dayton, where I usually go to play Star Wars D&D. And uh, two of our friends, unfortunately, got COVID this past week. (coughs) And so they were unable to do our regular session. So instead, we had a couple other friends join us, and we did a one-shot. And this is the first time that the DM, our friend Salem, uh, ran a one-shot where they TPK'd us. Classic. Classic, yeah. So we were playing fifth-level adventurers, and uh, the, the setup was it was inquisitorious. Um, based on the the Star Wars post uh, Order sixty six, Darth Vader basically adopts a bunch of uh, Force users and teaches them to be hunter killers for Jedi. That's pretty cool. Uh, so we were playing that, and we were hunting down and alter a uh, a a, a, mo- a copycat General Grievous. Mm-hmm. Um, the copycat General Grievous was very strong and killed us all. But yeah, so that's the first time. I think I've actually experienced uh, uh, character death, even though well, even if it is just a one shot. Well, you killed uh, uh, Garen Avernwild. Yes, I did. Ki- I've as a DM, I've killed a character, uh, but as a player, I've never had a kill- character killed up until this point. Interesting, interesting. I had um, I had one player who wanted to change a different char- to a different character, so we killed him. But that was kind of it. That's that's the closest experience I've had with that. So, like, purpose, purposely killed off narratively. Yeah, I don't exactly. You know, it's it's a little. Di- I don't exactly count that in the same realm. Yeah, it's because... it's, it's very different. It's very different. Because yeah, it's more. Sca- it was it was more of a Scanlan uh, walking away vibe. Mm. You know, where they walk away, where they we 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 got rid of them, mm-hmm. uh, and then later in that session they were reintroduced <laughs> with their new character, and it was like you fuckers. Like, you in know. those in those situations. I I all um because I've had that sort of thing happen too, but I've always been like, nah nah, your character doesn't have to die. Especially I said with, that. Oh. I said that. They they didn't want they didn't want the everyone else to be like, but we want this person back. <laughs> like, right, well. I mean, I've got no I've got no qualms about giving you a spectacular glorious execution. So you know, I always I uh so mine was back when I introduced I think I had introduced a dozen people to D and D all at once across two groups, mm-hmm. and most a lot of them. Across the two groups ended up dropping out one at, one by one. As you and do. one was like, "Kill me now," and I'm like, "Or I can just take your character and use it later." And they're like, "Oh, that's cool too. Go ahead and do that. I'm going to leave the group now." I was like, "Okay, bye." Okay, it m- makes sense. You're you have a whole life and a family and things that doesn't lie do and, sometimes. And you might not be as into D and D, which is totally fine. Absolutely, there's nothing wrong with not being into a game. Thank you for trying it. We that's what you know. That's exactly. what we appreciate is when you try exactly. it and decide you don't like it. Um, I have not been playing D and D. Didn't play Magic last night, so fuck you for that. Um, I'm working on my Aragorn the Uniter deck. Uh, we played that two weeks ago on mm-hmm. Monday Night Magic, and I also played it. We had a little. We had some friends over and did a little pod, which yeah. was lovely. Played that. Uh, went went hard. Went a little. Went went a little too hard. Flew a little too close to the sun. It's on it, that one. It's very. Uh, it's. 
I, well, you said you know you said when you're building that deck, it's not optimized by any means. No. Um, but no. It, but the way you built it, it does just have a lot of like really cool and powerful abilities. That's the thing. And it's, sometimes if you know we don't run a lot of removal in our pods, we really we need to. Run, I feel like I run a fair bit of removal, but I also hold it in my hand because mm-hmm. it's like I, I want you to do the thing, but also you're about to really fuck me up, so we're gonna stop that now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know. Uh, but yeah, we definitely don't run a lot of removal in our pods. Um, I think that's one thing that our friend Lincoln really likes because he has, I feel like he has a lot of removal. He is a, a lot of more, counters. He is a much more competitive and play to win kind of yeah, guy. He's a CDH guy. Yeah. Which is fine. Um, I, I had a lot of fun with that deck. Then I, then of course busted out the classic O'Hare Axonel mm-hmm. who currently has a 66% win rate. Might I add the one loss? I got two lands the entire game. That's the only time he's lost. <laughs> Got two fucking lands the entire game. I kept a two land hand that had, I think, an arcane signet. Or I think I... I think it had faithless looting. I did a faithless looting, and I also had, I think, a simian spirit guide. So I was able to get three mana for one, one turn, turn yeah. to get a gutter snipe out. And that's all I did that entire game. I was furious. Furious beyond all imagining. I think I eventually got a third land that I was able to flashback Faithless Looting with, and I still didn't get... A f- but then <clears> the game was over, I think, the very the next game, turn. The game was so far... That was so far unhinged. Mm-hmm. It was like, why'd you keep a two-land hand? And I'm like, because I had a Simeon Spirit Guide, and then also two things that I could play on turns one and two. One of them was a Faithless Looting. So I just kind of assumed I would hit a land drop in five cards, or yeah. a, car, a, a land draw in five cards, which... It's statistically likely. Especially, especially, it's a mono red deck, mm-hmm. so I don't need like certain colors. I just need anything that creates mana. I would have taken a soul ring. I would have taken the arcane signet. I would have taken. Uh, I have a ruby medallion in there. I think. Yeah. Um, a proxy from the proxy forge. Check out link in the bio. Um, but yeah, did that. That one won, and then we played another game that went way too long, much longer than it should have. But alas, 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 it was a good time. I'm also playing Persona 5 Royal again, because why not? I also need to play uh, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, Remake so that I can then play Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Mm. So that's a whole other, that's a whole other thing. Of course, we're not here to talk about video games. We're here to talk about Dungeons and Dragons and Magic the Gathering. Of course, for the Duels and Mana Dorks podcast, where we talk about D&D and Magic the Gathering every other week, Wednesdays. Uh, posts at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can get it on YouTube. Now in video form on the YouTube. Hello. If you're watching the YouTube video, I'm looking directly at you now. It's wonderful. You can also get it on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, um, YouTube Music, etc. Be sure to leave us a review on those platforms. It's really the only way to help discoverability on podcast platforms at all is to leave reviews. Uh, you can also follow us on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, discord all that kind of stuff sam the the upcoming releases are going to be fairly chonky i do want to let the people know we will be talking about dagger heart yes. later but we got a lot of magic and dd things to get to so sam what, are, what do we what have we learned in the upcoming releases yes so recently uh wizards of the coast announced their plans for their 50th anniversary which is this year uh starting off vecna eve of ruin uh that one is interesting. We will be having the D&D Beyond and the local game store release Yay. on May 7th. Two weeks early. Two weeks early. And then retail, things like Amazon and Target, will be on May 21st. Uh, this will come with the Vecna Nest of the Eldritch Eye, a prequel lower level adventure available on all pre-orders and on D&D Beyond for $4.99. That's a, that's a very reasonable price for a little prequel adventure. I like that they're doing it. Because Vecna Eve of Ruin, level 10 to level 20 adventure. Mm-hmm. Very high level. Nice little intro. Get the characters introduced. You kind of learn a little bit more about Vecna before the adventure starts. Get a little bit more background info. Um, but we got a lot of Vecna Eve of Ruin fun little little info dump uh, because they're talking about the 50th anniversary of D&D, which is this year. Yeah. And there's a lot of fun things that they're doing with it. Um, the Vecna Eve of Ruin, we now know that it's 256 pages. So it's quite uh, quite chunky. And we, book. Yes. Uh, and this is going to be a journey 
of the multiverse. Uh, quote, player characters are made aware of a plot by Vecna to remake the multiverse. And as you can imagine, it's not a very good situation. No. Vecna, kind of an evil guy, kind of a dickhead, <laughs> kind of a dickhead. But he's going to try and remake the entirety of the multiverse and gain control and make that under his domain. Uh, the main plot device is an artifact weapon from Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 2nd Edition, which is the Rod of Seven Parts. The players are going to travel to different D&D settings, including Dragonlance, Ravenloft, Eberron, Greyhawk, Avernus, and more to assemble the Rod of Seven Parts before fighting Vecna head on. Uh, Locations also house more iconic villains from D&D's past who are going to show up in Eve of Ruin to try and foil the party's efforts. Uh, it's going to start off with, um, oh my gosh, what's the name? Where Where is that name? Where was it? Uh, Illust Illustrial Silverhand, along with Tasha. Yes, that Tasha. That Tasha. And Mordenkainen. Yes, that Mordenkainen, who are going to inform the party of Vecna's plans to enact the ritual of remaking. And uh, they're going to send you off on that adventure. I think this sounds like the perfect D&D 5th edition send-off. Mm -hmm. that that's going to really culminate. Uh, it's been hinted at the the ritual of remaking in Vecna and some of the stuff with all the obelisks in previous adventures, and we're going to be revisiting some of those locations as well. I know that uh, Strahd is going to be a part of it, uh, and some other villains across other D&D campaigns. Uh, Sam, what, what are your thoughts on this nice little capstone for 5th edition that we're getting? Uh, I like it. Um, first off, think of how cool it would have been if if there's somebody out there, you know, who's actually gotten to play through a bunch of these adventures mm -hmm. and now gets to either like maybe play an old character or like gets to assemble a, 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 a multiversal party. Mm -hmm. That'd be cool. Um, there's there's definitely those player those play groups that like new D&D books out. All right. We're playing this adventure. Mm -hmm. Oh, new D&D books out. We're playing this adventure. And the people that have been doing that and really been enjoying it, even if they might have like some tension with Wizards of the Coast right now. Yeah. This is going to be like just dripping with fan service for them. You oh, can yeah. already tell. And I I believe that it was going into from third when it was when they were leaving third edition, they did something very similar. Um I believe you know, of course if you watch uh Matt Colville is one of the best for talking about old D D because he's mm -hmm. been playing for years and years and years. Uh, and he mentioned something similar and this was actually his prediction like three or four years ago, is that they would is that they would revisit this Vecna trying to recreate the multiverse uh, storyline as the cap. Um, so I think this is really cool. The the Nest of the Eldritch Eye as a prequel adventure, I think, is a really great idea. I love that it's just included if you pre-order the book. Honestly, I might have to pre-order the book now just <laughs> just because it sounds really, really cool. Uh, we haven't really bought many D&D books recently just because no. they haven't really spoken to us. Um, but I like it as a nice little bonus adventure that's going to be for lower level player characters. It would be it's going to be a nice little intro bit. You can either carry that party through to the main adventure. You can have it be like pulling, like you said, pulling characters from old adventures, uh, just kind of a lower level thing. Get a little bit of uh, information about Vecna and learn about him more through his minions and the cult of Vecna and all that kind of stuff. It's re it sounds like a great product. Also. You can only you can get it for just five dollars. Oh, yeah, DDB on honestly, too. that's not bad. Not, not at bad all. at all. Um, let's. I'm, I'm interested to see if any of the other adventures get picked up in between then and now with people hearing about this, being like, "Oh well, we've got a couple of months. Why don't we knock out a? Why don't we knock out a a, a, a dragon lance or a? Or why don't we try to knock out an, an Avernus uh, campaign real quick and then yeah, dive into that. Get, go back into Curse of Strahd. Get into Greyhawk. All that kind of stuff. That sounds very, very fun. Also, I will say Chris Perkins teased a little bit, particularly with the inclusion of Greyhawk in the Vecna Eve of Ruin, that they might be uh, some subtle nods to the history as well as seeding for possibilities in the future. Yeah, because Greyhawk's one of the few um, planes that they didn't actually revisit in the past decade, mm -hmm. which, of course, 2020, 2014 was when 5th edition dropped. Yes. And now, so this will be, I think this will be a lovely way to sweep us into... Fifth edition? Yes, the new fifth edition, aka one D and D, aka fifth edition V two, aka patch notes uh, D and D five dot uh, two dot oh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next up, we have the making of original D and D 
1970 to 1976. That's going to be dropping on June 18th. Again, this nice. is more of a coffee table history of D&D book. Yeah, I'm probably going to have some nice pictures in it, hopefully. Uh, if you're into the history, that's a, that's a fun thing. You can also uh, check out Of Dice and Men, uh, which is another. They just republished that. They sent us a free copy of it, which was very nice. Uh, Dart Frog, Frog Dart Publishing. Yes, they sent us a free copy of Dice and Men. Uh, it's been republished with a uh, new foreword from Joe Manganiello, as well as an afterword that's gone into the last decade since the book was published originally, but when 5th edition was about to come out, as opposed to now ha- including all the stuff, including all of the recent foibles of Wizards of the Coast. So that's pretty cool. Next up, we have Quests from the Infinite Staircase. Uh, that gets a D&D Beyond and local game store release on July 9th, and a full release on July 16th. Yes, uh, the Quest from the Infinite Staircase is the anthology book. We've been getting a lot of these, and this one is particularly special. The anthology books generally have been some of the best books yes. that they've been making for 5th edition. Uh, we now know it is a 224-page anthology book, book, and it's republishing six classic adventures from D&D's 5th edition, his, or from D&D's history, all updated for 5th edition. The adventures include uh, The Lost City, which was originally released in 1982, When a Star Falls, which was released in 1984, Pharaoh, which was released in 1982, Uh, The Lost Caverns of Sokanth, Sokanth, yeah, Sokanth, S, sorry, T S O J C A N T H. Do with that what you will. Lost Caverns of Sokanth, which was originally released in 1982 as well, and then Expedition to the Barrier Peaks, which was originally released in 19. 76 uh the whole macguffin here the whole little uh through line that's pulling in these old adventures is the uh infinite staircase itself an extra dimensional realm with a staircase that spirals for infinity uh, as well as a new character nafas uh, which is a noble genie whose existence comes from the winds blown through the infinite staircases doorways for all of eternity uh so much like other of the anthology books there Mm -hmm. is like the central nexus the radiant city for example um the yawning portal the yawning portal where you can go through and do all of these different adventures uh and the infinite staircase itself you don't really need any plane shifting you don't need uh, extra plane or travel at all you just kind of need to have your party happen upon a door uh so these adventures of course you can create an infinite staircase adventure where you're revisiting all of these old things i feel like some of the old D &D hats uh that are that are hanging around and have been playing D D for a very long time will thoroughly enjoy that mm-hmm. uh but you can also take these adventures as you would any other D uh anthology book and just drop them in yeah it's a wonderful time wonderful time uh what do you think of the quests of the infinite staircase so the anthology books is something we've never really gotten into. Um, just be it, we do a lot of homebrew uh, versus also, you know, it's a yearly release. And I think this is one that deserves a yearly release. Absolutely. These anthology books as opposed to a lot of the settings and a lot of the extra stuff that, D- that Wizards puts out. That being said, uh, in the past, we have played some from our friend Salem, who likes to run out of these books, actually. Mm-hmm. Usually they do a lot. Like, I believe if you be- if we remember... Um, it was the Candlekeep. It was one of the Candlekeep, Candlekeep mysteries. Yeah, Candlekeep had like 20 adventures, one for each level. The Radiant Citadel, I believe, had 13 adventures. So this one is a, is a lot more, is a lot fewer adventures, but it seems like it's going to be just as dense. Uh, if not more dense, I think the anthology books are usually right around 200 pages. Mm-hmm. And this one's 224. So each each one of these adventures is giving is given plenty of space to actually dive into the depth and breadth. Yeah. of these old adventures yeah the designers um uh if you go on to the wizards uh youtube page they do have a about a 15 minute video talking with the designers about each of these ones and uh some of them sound very interesting i believe it's expedition uh to the barrier peaks i believe it was uh you you you, you get laser guns mm-hmm. yeah the, 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 yeah <laughs> very not D D, but it's also in the dmg so yeah. yeah, if you're into that futuristic kind of stuff, but I just love, for one, I love the cover art that shows the genie, and it's all very colorful and fun. But uh, all these the anthology books, in terms of value proposition, are the best D and D products that they've been making for the last several years. Uh, the campaign settings are always very popular. Adventure books are popular, but the anthology books are the ones that have just the most value packed into them especially if you uh don't want to put in the effort of doing completely homebrew campaigns 
Right. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that at all. Uh, actually, also related to that is Wizards has announced that they are going to do a throwback uh, and do tournament-style 50th anniversary play. They have not done that in a very, very long time. Um, tournament play is a sort of competitive way to play Dungeons and Dragons where the DM has a checklist to keep track of what you did and the various actions that you take have points assigned to them, damage, uh, spell casting, mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff. Uh, enemy, I assume enemy kills and stuff. I don't know the specifics of the checklist at all. But uh, as a part of the 50th anniversary, 50th anniversary uh they're going to do uh a series at local games sh- at local game shops uh from march 29th until april 29th so coming up in a couple of days uh when this podcast released and running for a month you'll be able to go into uh some local game stores and play descent into the lost caverns of Sokenth, uh which is the adventure that's adapted from quest for the infinite staircase Uh, In that adventure, you can play it for about four hours in either a standard mode, which is more casual, you're not keeping score, it's not a tournament, or the actual tournament mode where the DM is keeping track of your score just for fun. Just for fun. Yes, as a a nice little throwback to the olden days when uh, dungeon delving and stuff was a bit more prevalent in D&D. Which is very fun. Do you plan on doing this? I do not plan on doing this. No, I don't either. Uh, I, I love that they're bringing it to the local game store, though. I think that's the right move. Uh, Wizards has not been very consumer forward in in the uh, in the realm of the local game store in recent years. No. I am curious. As to, I, I would like to see how it works. I'm sure there will be videos of uh, online of somebody playing in the competitive format. But obviously, the last time they did this, um, the internet was in a much younger format. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I think that power gaming was probably not as insane as it might be today. Mm-hmm. I'm sure there were power gamers back, you know, all through history, people who love to win. But, you know, these days there's entire you know, Reddit forums just dedicated to how can I break this game? And when you've had a version of D&D going for 10 years and having dozens of books and a seemingly infinite wealth of character options, yeah. balancing everything is just not possible. And particularly at certain, like once you reach a certain character level, I would argue like seven to nine, mm-hmm. e- all all sense of of scaling kind of just, just goes, goes completely out the window. Out the window. Yeah. Uh, I, there there's some ridiculous character builds that have you stupidly powerful at level two all the way to level twenty. Yeah. Um, and. I'm sure. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of those kinds of people. There's going to be some very interesting tables, and I bet very different from Adventures League style. Yeah, I was going to say. I wonder play. how it's going to compare to that because Adventures League, there's, uh, you know, I don't know how much has changed since we last talked about. It. I think like two years ago on the podcast, mm-hmm. uh, but they have very strict rules on character building, on character interaction, on things you are and aren't allowed to do in the game i think the general rule if it hasn't changed is uh you get the player's handbook options and uh whatever campaign is being run so if they were if there was an adventurer's league and they were running uh call of the nether deep you would get access to the call of the nether deep uh character options and then you get one other book Mm -hmm. that you can add and that book can be um volo's guide to monster for race options it could be uh, Xanathar's Guide to Everything, it could be Wild Mount, it could be whatever, mm-hmm. but you get one other book. Uh, so that kind of helps limit the the scope of what your character has access to. Uh, so if you're looking at, say, like revised ranger options and you wanted to play stuff out of Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, you would not you would not then be able to do um like a gloom stalker ranger from xanathar's guide to everything uh you would have to pick which one you want Mm -hmm. and that kind of helps with limiting but uh with tournament play i don't know if there's going to be any limitations like that yeah who knows we'll see we'll We'll see see. adventures league has not really ever been our thing um i know there's just a little side tangent a lot of people have issues with adventures league and how it's run most of the time um oh yeah it hasn't been popular for years i don't think yeah it's it really comes down to who is running it, and Wizards hasn't really been supporting it a whole lot mm-hmm. in recent years, uh, especially post in a post-COVID world. Oh, yeah. It's not nearly as popular. Um, and then lastly... Lastly, we have the 1D&D playbooks. The Player's Handbook is set to release on September 17th, 
the Dungeon Master's Guide on November 12th, and the One D&D Monster Manual on February 18th. Yes, and we did learn that they're going to have, uh, they're going to be released to local game stores in D&D Beyond about a week or two early. Where is that information? Oh my gosh. Yes. Uh, releasing on September 17th, the player's handbook is going to, you're going to be able to get it a few weeks earlier on D&D Beyond on September 3rd, uh, October 28th, a little early for the Dungeon Master's Guide, uh, and then the ever the ever useful and ever slowly failing IGN says that you can get it early you can get the monster manual early on February 18th which i don't know if anyone was paying attention to what sam said about 30 seconds ago <laughs> that's just the release date so yeah we have uh the a wonderful website to check out wpn.wizards.com is where you can get all of the specific information for they use it for um local game stores but they don't have any of the 1D D stuff certainly but i would suspect a week early for um the monster manual as well which would put us at february 11th right before valentine's day it should be lovely a you wonderful could, valentine's day you could surprise your your dungeon master with a book <laughs> Particularly if you're in a relationship with them. Oh, yeah. Yes. All right. Moving on to Magic the Gathering. Outlaws of Thunder Junction uh, is coming up. The pre-release for that will be April 12th, with the full release being April 9th. Uh, we can expect to see some spoilers here 19th. soon. It's April 19th, Sam. I know I know you're still hopped up on anesthesia. A little bit. But... Allow me to correct. The full <laughs> release will be on April 19th, and we can expect to see some spoilers soon, probably here in the next week and a half. Oh, yeah. Uh, Modern Horizons 3 will have its pre-release on June 7th, with its full release a week later on June 14th. The Assassin's Creed Universes Beyond will be dropping on July 5th. Note about the Assassin's Creed, that is an Aftermath-style set. Yes, they'll be using Beyond Boosters, which I believe contains seven cards per booster set. Yeah, they booster. really they really thought that Aftermath was going to be a great idea, and then when people fucking hated it, they were like, oh, we got a reverse course on a lot of sets, but oops, we designed an entire set specifically around this style of booster, so... Yeah, they didn't, and, and as a note for the Assassin's Creed, they didn't, they're not even coming out with pre-cons. No. Nope, it's just these draft booster, or not draft booster, beyond, beyond booster, collector booster, and that's it. That's that's all it is. That, oh, and starter decks. And starter decks. Starter decks are probably going to be the best value proposition. Oh, yeah. We'll probably pick some of those up. Yeah, we'll definitely get the starter decks. Those are usually like $20 or less. Like, that's by far the best. If, if, if you are cool with starter deck options, uh, those are a great intro because they're very cheap. Yeah, 60 cards and... Oftentimes, those cards have a little bit of a price spike right when they release because nobody buys them. Yeah, nobody buys them. The, the starter decks do have exclusive cards in them, usually. Mm -hmm. The Lord of the Rings ones, for example, I believe each had four cards that you could only get from starter decks. Actually, no, I think they had more that you could only get from starter decks. And those cards are multiple dollars each because nobody bought them. Yeah. Uh, highly recommend. Uh, then we have Bloomborough with the pre-release set for July 26th and the full release on August 2nd. And then Duskmorn House of Horrors will be coming in Q4 of this year. And before we move on from Magic the Gathering, because we don't have a ton of magic news, but we do need to bring up uh, one of the elephants in the room, that uh, uh, something that was discovered today as of the recording of this podcast. Um, yet another plagiarism scandal for Magic the Gathering, this time with uh, the Murders at Karlov Manor Commander deck. Uh, this one is specifically the Deadly Disguise deck. I know it because I just bought the Deadly Disguise deck mm. like yesterday because it's only thirty dollars on Amazon, hey. and I'm building a disguise gruel deck with Yaris of the Old Gods. Uh, so it has like a ton of cards that I'm going to use. But one of the cards in it is Trouble in Pairs, a card that people were very very excited about. It's a two and a two white white enchantment. Opponents that uh, attempt to take extra turns do not get to take extra turns. Uh, and then it does some other effects. But the big thing, um, one of one of the characters depicted on the card is uh, a cyberpunk looking woman with a mohawk. This image is a mirrored and edited version of some art from cyberpunk uh, from the cyberpunk world in 1994. Original art book set. Sorry, the background. Let's see. Let's see. 
Oh my gosh. One user had sourced the original art to a book set in a cyber in the cyberpunk world released in 1994. Originally drawn by Donato Giancola, the artist created an account on Reddit specifically to comment that the art had been stolen. In a comment, Giancola states, quote, the art is stolen. <laughs> and he accompanied it with the image extrapolating on this, which reads, Hey, Faye Dalton, do you mind not stealing my work on highly paid public commercial commissions in the genre which I make my living and hold my reputation dear? <sighs> that is embarrassing. Yeah, so if, if you don't remember... Only so only a few months ago, I believe in December, it came out that in the Lost Caverns Ixalan Wayfarer's Bobble, the there had been a, a staircase, a set piece in a one in the art that had been same thing, flipped, cut out, and pasted into this card, and uh, that artist also called out uh, the person on the the the. Art- the artist of the original work called out yes. the Magic the Gathering artist. The Magic the Gathering artist, uh, Wizards of the Coast, then said that they were no longer going to be working with that Magic the Gathering artist and going to be reviewing all the pieces they, they had submitted. Uh, so... Not, re- not, reviewing, not reviewing quite well. I will say, when it comes to Wizards of the Coast, um, quality control. How many people have they laid off? A lot. A lot. A whole lot of people. Uh, artists are also contracted work and they sign contracts and if they choose to breach those contracts then they are legally liable Uh, and so Wizards of the Coast while they could be looking into every single art piece that is submitted they clearly do not have the manpower or money to do that Uh, so it becomes incumbent on the community to call this kind of stuff out so the card Trouble in Pairs has been known about for many many weeks at this point Yeah, Uh, it was a card that was spoiled a while ago before the set was released and before the commander decks were released and people were very excited about it because it has powerful abilities um i do absolutely love that the original artist that had their work stolen created a reddit account to then call this out and be like hey magic artist the fuck you doing (laughs) i adore that and that is really really the only reasonable way that uh members of the magic the gathering community have to hold these artists accountable because wizards really doesn't have the um the manpower and the money to be properly vetting all of their stuff and i think that's very very clear at this point so i was just checking um, we do record this podcast, uh, and we have a TikTok live stream the day before where, while we were recording this podcast, and we take questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and ideas from the audience at the end of the podcast, but well, sometimes we have it a little bit during. Well, uh, right now I was actually just jumping into um, Mana Box, which is a, a, D- or a Magic the Gathering app, uh, and I was checking Faye Dalton's work entirely. It uh, looks like she's done, I assume Faye is a girl, has done 15 pieces for... Wizards of the Coast, um, most of them universes beyond sets, uh, quite a few from, that I own actually, from uh, the... Doctor Who? No, the uh, Evil Dead. Ah, yeah, yeah. Evil Dead and the um, baseball card style. Oh, yes, yes. uh, As well as then a couple from Karlov Manor. Um, So that's just always something we're interested in is when we see the the artists uh, doing things like this, we have to ask... How much have they worked for Wizards of the Coast before? And this seems like, you know... know. A relatively new artist. Relatively new. But it's done some lovely work. Done great work. And uh, the Evil Dead stuff, I believe, is Secret Lair It is, work yes. Both, too. Yeah, it is. So clearly they, they liked this artist's work quite a bit. And again, this we, we talked about this with the Wayfarer's Bobble from Lost Caverns of Ixalan. How much pressure... And what kind of time crunch are these artists put under? Like, I'm not an artist. I know that art is done in many stages. Mm -hmm. So, Trouble in Pairs, obviously you're going to need two characters and a background of some kind. The background is not anything particularly special. Uh, The background is the background from the cyberpunk art. They took the character in the foreground from the cyberpunk art 
changed the clothing on it, removed pieces from, removed a gun from it, changed a hand position to add a, a melee weapon of some kind, and then created a second character to put opposite to make it a pair that was in trouble. Yeah. I look at that, and I think the amount of effort that you put in to alter another piece of art and draw new things from that piece of art how much time did you save by sourcing the art originally taking it altering it and then having to add a second character to it anyway how much time is even being saved with that yeah is wizards contacting you and saying you have 48 hours to make a piece of art yeah like or are you being given two weeks and you're what? overloading yourself with with other projects trying yeah. Make, yeah trying to make ends meet or not you're you, i think now obviously with this being the second time we can be sure that the community is going to call this out absolutely absolutely and i gotta say i'm glad that i'm gonna have this card that <laughs> i ordered that pre-con before this happened because <laughs> i would not be surprised if this card has some value added of people being like well, I want the I want the stolen art card because of the story. I want I want to get the Wayfarer's Bobble from Lost Caverns of Ixalan just to be like, hey, this art was plagiarized because it's a fun story. This is my wall of plagiarized art from Magic the Gathering. <laughs> literally, literally, that I it it really is a shame. And uh, which precon was that again? The uh, the Deadly Disguise. Deadly Disguise. The Deadly Disguise precon. Uh, that's the what would that be? What the Naya. The Naya deck. The one that has uh, Descana, the Rage yes, Mother. the Rage Mother is the backup commander. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Um, and then one other thing before we move on from Magic the Gathering. Uh, possible spoilers leaked from a Beetle and Grimm Magic the Gathering product associated with uh, Bloomborough. They're creating a uh, collab... Their Beetle and Grimm is collaborating with Magic the Gathering for a Bloomborough token set... Uh, it's going to include a metal life counter of 1 to 40, some Bloomborough themed dice, uh, D20, 2D10s, and 3D6s, as well as seven aluminum token cards, three 1-1 one, one fish tokens, which are just little fish cutouts. Fishes, yeah. They're little fishes with 1-1 one, one written on them, and five uh, plus one metal counters. Not plus one, plus one. Nope, just Simply plus one. Plus one. Don't know what that is, uh, but we learned that food is going to be a, an artifact that is, or a uh, is going to be an artifact token that's generated. Uh, the one one rabbit, not really surprising. The one one fish, not really surprising. But we did get a spoiler for the Warren War Leader. Uh, it's a token that has an ability, which is not entirely crazy. There's plenty of tokens that have special activated abilities and stuff. Uh, an ability when it attacks and specifically calls out its mana cost of two and a white. When it attacks, you may create a 1-1 white rabbit creature token that's tapped and attacking, or give your attacking creatures plus one plus one until end of turn. It is possible that the rabbit token in the image could be the token the war and war leader that the token war and war leader can create. Um, so much like you, what was it that you said the progenitor ooze? Yes, called? Avi, the progenitor ooze. Yes, so that card that is a ooze that's two two and has storm. Yes, and it creates a token copy of itself that is not. I almost dropped my. I almost dropped my bottle of AL eight. My apologies. That would have been hilarious. Uh, but the the progenitor ooze has storm, and for every every uh, every time it it creates a token copy of it that's yeah. not legendary. Um, so I imagine that there is going to be a card called War and War Leader that creates a token of called war and war leader um and i bet that it has to be a token so that it doesn't legend rule itself or something Maybe. um but then also uh the token uh, for beetle and grim that has this very cute little art on it uh i would be willing to bet that it has to call out its mana cost because there are cards that have that call out the mana cost of other cards mm -hmm. uh and so they don't really affect tokens but if you're getting a token copy of something that isn't legendary then it still maintains its mana value yes uh and i wouldn't be surprised if this is just a formatting thing to avoid wizards of the coast so uh, wizards of the coast couldn't you couldn't use it as like a proxy yeah. of the war and war leader would be my guess uh, but there's a lot of people thinking that it's a bit of a spoiler. Uh, it will be available um, Q3 2024 if you're into that. I do love a I do love a metal token. Yeah, and I mean Beetle and Grimm, uh, of course, uh, company 
owned by Matthew Lilliard, who was Shaggy. Uh, he mostly works with D and D up to this point, yeah. uh, creating specialty art projects similar to this, except for D and D adventures. Uh, so this is kind of cool to see. They have, they make great products. Um, people who get them really love them. So yeah, it's pretty cool to see. Yes, uh, very very into it. Also, in leaks, whatever. It's we're gonna get we're gonna get copious amounts of Bloomberg spoilers in the coming weeks and months anyway. So, yeah, yeah. I don't. Really it's know. just I mean that's the thing is though is everybody's always jonesing for that hit of leaked information early. Oh yeah. As opposed, you know, pre spoiler season. Oh yeah. All right. Let's get in. Let's get into the old meat and potatoes now of Daggerheart. So last episode of the podcast, they dropped the Daggerheart beta the day we were recording the podcast. So we only had a couple of hours to give some, to take in as much information as we could, give some first impressions. Sam, now that we've had two weeks to ruminate, mm-hmm. to digest on the Dagger Heart system, and now that you've looked into it a bit more, you uh, watched their session zero as well as their one shot of playing Dagger Heart. Yes. Uh, so we're going to start with you about what, how, how have some of your thoughts changed, adjusted? What are your, what are your current vibes that you're getting off of Dagger Heart? I think that it is still in the realm that I kind of, I kind of uh, uh, you know, gestured at pri- previously. It being this high fantasy um, hero roleplay game, uh, the the whole the hope tokens and the fear tokens, um, I think have what I that's that's the main part that I didn't exactly see as animated as I uh, until I watched the critical role video. Yeah. Um, because these things are so fluid, you're constantly rolling. You know, as in as in any good TTRPG, well, you want to roll. A lot. You want to roll a lot, and uh, in this one, since every time something happens, either the DM gets a resource or the players get a resource, and of course the players being encouraged to use their resource since they're going to be constantly getting it back, but the DM gets to hoard this resource and gets to be ready to use it at any given time. After having seen the one shot they did. I am even more enthused with this this concept of the of this resource, this give and take resource. Mm-hmm. And what what way was Matt using it that really got you Jones in? The one that really got me was uh, probably about three hours into the it was a four hour po- uh, session, I believe. About three hours in, they got into a third or fourth combat, and the way the combat works, of course, is the players get to go first, uh, and when they make an action. They put a action token onto the onto the tracker, and the players get to keep taking actions until they either roll with fear, meaning they they their fear die is higher, or uh, they fail a roll. At that point, the DM can take actions. What really got me uh, like shocked me into understanding what this was was all right. Combat starts, and Matt goes all right. I'm going to spend two fear tokens to immediately take my action from previously in the sessions. And he goes, and then I'm going to use these fear tokens to immediately do this, 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 and this. And it's like, oh, yeah, that's how the that's how the arc of the session is meant to be going. You know, they're doing good. They're doing good. They, you know, maybe they're doing through the whole thing. They're going, and then suddenly the DM can just ramp it up using these fear tokens all of a sudden. Mm-hmm. Or you know, don't it doesn't have to be spread out. It doesn't say you you lose them at any point. It's just once when when it's it's um dramatically effective to use them that's when you can drop the big bombs yeah that that of the the fear and the hope token aspect of it was one of the things that i was the most excited for uh when when hearing about the rolling of the 2d12s uh the hope and the fear is i think the most enticing part mm-hmm. of this system uh while you were talking i pulled up uh on youtube you can watch the video version of the podcast the last the last episode of the podcast was the first video podcast uh and it's probably the best uh the best performing podcast we've done uh, on the YouTube. And we got several comments that uh, have some, some interesting, interesting thoughts. Um, <clears throat> some interesting thought that I wanted to dive into. Uh, Vertrucio on YouTube said, I know you keep saying you haven't played, but I'd like to point out that D&D itself has a lot of odd additional complexity built into it just for the sake of being complex. 
those have been stripped out of Daggerheart and many other D&D successors. The attributes in D&D do what, really? What's with all these slots? There's tables for a bunch of stuff. What's AC and why is it one number? Why does everything boil down to advantage, disadvantage, etc.? D&D is chock full of this kind of baggage. The savings in mental load from stripping that out can be put towards these new systems, mm. which is an interesting take because specifically there's a couple of things. The, the, AC, the AC example, what is AC and why is it one number? It's your armor class and it's one number because that's the number that people have to roll to hit you. Um, Daggerheart has two numbers that you have to worry about now, which is your armor, your armor points and your armor slots, and then your evasion score. Your evasion is whether or not you're hit, and then your armor slots and armor points are how much you can reduce the damage by. Mm -hmm. And then how much you reduce the damage by will determine how much damage you actually take because they have to hit certain thresholds to deal damage to you. So while I agree that D&D does have some added complexity, especially older editions of D&D, 5th edition kind of simplified a lot of things, boiled a lot of modifiers down to simply rolling two dice, taking the higher. Sure. Um, and obviously the tables are a whole bunch, like spell slots are have always been complex. So I'm with Daggerheart, I'm very intrigued by the cards for abilities and spells, uh, as well as just having one pool of resources that everything draws from. Yeah. Uh, but do you think that D and D does have a lot of complexity, or do you? Because my biggest thing with Daggerheart was that it seemed like they were just adding complexity for complexity's sake. And while I've softened a bit on like the damage thresholds, mm -hmm. I still feel like that's just an adding another layer because you want big damage numbers so that the players feel like they're doing a lot of damage and taking a lot of damage, while the actual damage being dealt is just slot based. Mm -hmm. I, I agree in one of our favorite phrases is uh, two things can be true at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, and I agree that both that D and D is definitely complex. And yes, it is. Fifth edition is less complex than say three or 3.5. Yeah. And that was very intentional. Um, and I will say a lot of, a lot of uh, other TTRPGs do strip away a lot of, this a lot of the mechanics if you look at uh say the kids on bike series um that that uses each of the d the dice and those are now your attribute scores basically strength decks whatever um whereas you can even strip it down further in quest mm -hmm. which just uses one dice for everything basically that being said to make it interesting or to make it what you know to make the game they want it to be I think that it's fine. You know, they do. They did add the complexity uh, of of that armor threshold, making the armor class separate from the evasion score. So, um, I don't. I don't discount either system, D and D or Daggerheart. They're, they're just different. They're just different. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, we're not discounting either one of them mm -hmm. for being different. Uh, it's just to just to you know something to talk about is why are they different and how is this going to affect the game? Yeah. My big thing is that they're they're advertising and and promoting Daggerheart a lot as kind of like a pick up and play. Uh, when you and you look at like the cards for abilities and spells, and it's very easy to grab a card and set a load out, and like that makes it feel mm -hmm. more board gamey. Whereas if they wanted it to be simpler and easier to play, it's interesting to me that they're, with certain aspects of it, adding more layers of complexity and specificity for things that used to be simpler. Like just everyone, everyone understands what hit points are. Video games have been around for decades. It's true. And even if you don't play video games, there most people understand what a pool of hit points are. They're your health. Mm -hmm. And when you reach zero, you are unconscious or you die. And now... You take damage, which then determines you have to then put look against a chart and then where it fits is how many actual points of damage you take as opposed to the big number points of damage, the actual real damage you take, which just seems unnecessary to me. Um, and another another comment from Good Omens in All Things on YouTube. Uh, 
I enjoyed your discussion of Dagger Harp and Heart and hope you look more into it. A couple things to consider. The hit point change isn't to make stress mean something. It's to make damage less swingy. In Dagger Heart, resurrection is not really a thing. Having a damage range means that you are less likely to go down due to one bad hit. This is especially significant in lower levels when one nat 20 roll can take out a character, even from a CR appropriate enemy that's challenge rating. Uh, I think that it also allows for the ideas of combat to be more narrative. And then one last thing about scars. You have to roll at your level or lower to take a scar and thus lose a hope slot. That means at lower levels, you are less likely to lose a hope from dying, but the longer you adventure and more often death becomes a possibility, the more those brushes with death may impact your character. Which is an interesting consideration because I hadn't thought about that with the scars specifically. Um, and making damage less swingy, I get that as well. Yeah. Uh, that was that was this definitely a problem with uh, fifth edition at low levels, like sub level three. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, it was very easy to, you know, for a DM to be like, okay, I want to make a, a cool enemy for them to fight. You know, the, oh, the I, enchant- gave the, I gave them a D eight instead of a D six, and they have plus three instead of plus two to their damage, and they crit on a seven damage roll, and now they're dead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the enchanted bear attacks your wizard, and make a new character. Make a new character, which I totally get. And that is, I I do agree with that statement, Mm -hmm. that the thresholds make damage much less swingy because you're either taking one, two, or three points of damage. Yeah. Period. And that's the most, three is the most you can take, and a stress is the least you can take. Um, I think that there might have been more elegant ways to fix the damage swinginess, which might just be as simple as uh, low-level enemies deal one point of damage and two points of damage on a crit. And then you can play around with that a bit more for higher level enemies. Um, I will say that this comment softened me quite a bit on the damage thresholds, though, because that definitely adds a lot more... um, It it adds more logic to the system in place. Mm -hmm. I definitely definitely agree with that. What do you think about the scars, though, and the, the, the prevalence of the, the possibility of death and the ramifications of that in Dagger Heart. Yeah, that wasn't something we had looked very much into at the at the point of last one, of last discussion. Um, and yeah, that's that's very interesting seeing how the the hope the hope you can only gain five hope. At mm-hmm. a t- you can only hold five hope at a time. Yeah, and it it adds to the fact that you're mechanically you're you're making the narrative and the the mechanics ugh, the narrative and the mechanics line up with each other uh which is something that i i, I agree that D often fails to do you know as you go on your character gets stronger and stronger and unless you as the player choose to to give them some sort of implementation of you know i was eaten by a dragon at one point yeah most players you know not not saying anything bad about players, just most players don't necessarily think about that or don't choose to make that uh, that that change in their character, how their character is played as time goes on. Mm-hmm. But this does, like I said, mechanically give something to the narrative. Yeah, I'm, I, that's one thing that I do really like is that they they Daggerheart does a much better job than a lot of tabletop RPG systems of tying in the narrative with actual game mechanics Mm -hmm. and giving long lasting ramifications for bad things that happen to your character that don't completely turn off your character. Yeah. You know, they just give you, just give you a little bit of like, Oh yeah. Okay. I remember that. Fuck. All right. That sucked. On the flip side, the experiences, the way that you, you don't choose like, yeah, yeah, just a select box you get to, when you level up, you have the option to gain a new experience which you, know, you descriptively write out basically what it is. Um, and then I, how that mechanically will benefit you. Yeah, exactly. So that gives it the other side of things, yes. which I think is very cool. I love I love the experiences uh, system with that. One last comment from the YouTube video I want to talk about, and this is another damage threshold thing that uh, also helped change my mind. Uh, it says user and then long string of numbers, but when you click on it, it's anti campanin, which I believe is some... I don't know. Uh, they said, quote, 
The damage threshold idea is to make sure players don't ever have to do math like 73 minus 18 on the fly. They can just glance at incoming damage and see 18 is larger than 15, therefore I get three hit points of damage. You're looking at it from the perspective of reading the rules, but people will be playing at the table and thresholds are much simpler than large numbers to play with off the cuff. The same idea with armor negating damage. You rarely have to deal with the large damaging numbers. What matters to the player is how much above their threshold the damage is and if they can use armor to bring it down below the threshold or not. You get the feeling of rolling massive damages, but all the math is kept to stuff like is 12 more than 10. That does simplify the gaming at the table. That was another comment that... Mm -hmm that softened me a bit on on the damage thresholds. I'll have to actually play with it, which we will be doing this Friday, yay. Uh, I'll be playing a ranger, I'm excited. And um, I love the ranger. I'm a, you are I'm, a, a ranger. I'm, a, I'm a slut for a ranger, if I'm being completely honest with you. Freaking Aragorn, son of Arathorn. Strider, huh, give me some of that in my life. But uh, I, I will have to, we'll have to wait for actually playing the game to get a final verdict on the feel of it at the table because yes. we have not had the chance to play it yet um do you have any other other dagger heart thoughts uh we haven't really had a chance to dive into the character classes too deeply i've looked a little bit at the ranger and i find a lot of the options very enticing um the, it seems like the beast companion for the ranger is infinitely better than mm -hmm. the D, D options have been for ranger animal companions I will say, but um, I like the card system for character class abilities. Um, I like the the loadouts that you can choose with different character. But once you get more, which won't happen until later levels, like yeah. you basically have access to everything that you possibly can for a long time, uh, and then are going to be able to swap them out on the fly if you need to. And some of them are going to have no cost associated with swapping them in on the fly. So like more situational things, you can just leave out of your loadout yeah. for the day for the adventuring day, and then pull in if that situation would benefit from the more niche abilities that you might take. I will say. Well, from watching the videos, uh, that aspect right there that you, you spend stress to swap in and out, and there are some zero stress things like you're saying, that seemed to be one of Matt's things that Matt was super excited about because mm -hmm. he brought it up several times and be like, you know, leveling up, oh, uh, but I can I can put this over here and then pull it in and he'd be like, yeah, but if it's zero, then you can very excited about that. Matt Matt's a joy. <laughs> Matthew Mercer, quit quit bullying that man. And let him not be so damn depressed all the time, please. We talked about it on the last episode. Fuck those people. Anyway. And I will say, meeting Matt Mercer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> taught me how, that I need to get a good stance for taking pictures with famous people. Because yes. Because I look like a fucking idiot in that picture it standing next to him. It didn't help. Like, we found... I'm, I, met the, I met the man in a bathroom. <laughs> That's not a great spot. And then right outside the bathroom is where everybody got a bunch of pictures with Matt Mercer. And we had a lot of overhead lighting. It wasn't great. All right. I got to, I, you could see the shadow under my moves <laughs> is, what, is all I'm getting at. All right. Uh, do you have any other last thoughts for Daggerheart? I can't wait uh, no, to play I'm excited it. To, I'm excited to play this weekend. I'm, I'm going to be looking into it the more the next couple days. And uh, I'll be excited to talk about it after we get some, a chance to play it. Yeah, I can't wait to print out the cards and actually have them physically and play with them. Lick them. Lick them. Stick them to foreheads. Yeah. That'll be a good time. Ooh, it's like the... It's like the guess who I am thing where you oh, yeah, stick the yeah. card to your head. head anyway, dance. that's what that game is called. Nice, nice. Uh, one last little wrap-up item. Uh, since this is not just exclusively D and D and Magic: The Gathering, uh, tabletop RPGs, just in general, uh, I wanted to point out that one of my one of the game series that spawned my favorite one of my favorite game series, Persona, uh, Shin Megami Tensei. Persona, uh, Shin Megami Tensei is getting a tabletop RPG based on. Persona's video game series and an English release after 20 years. Uh, so the uh, publishing arm Lionwing uh, has been working on uh, Shin Megami Tensei, the role-playing game, Tokyo Conception. Uh, Shin Megami Tensei, along with a lot of other tabletop RPGs for these kind of more Japanese-centric video game properties, have been released in Japan for a very long time. And they've not really ever been localized because these kind of niche tabletop RPG products are very niche. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they have a very small market. But Linewing has been localizing a ton of these tabletop RPGs from Japanese designers, uh, including Group SGR's picaresque, 
picturesque Roman Little Witch Academia esque Fledge Witch RPG, the Tokusatsu inspired Convictor Drive Armored by Grief, and Eldritch Escape. Tokyo, a game that seems to draw on Call of Cthulhu's cultural dominance in Japan. Shin Megami Tensei, the role-playing game Tokyo Conception, uh, can be pre-ordered as a physical and digital PDF that will be released in the second half of 2024. Um, you can see they're going they're going to feature a lot of uh, stat blocks and stuff for classic enemies like uh, like Jack Frost and mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff. Which, if you're into the SMT uh, franchise in Persona, you'll recognize a lot of these characters. SMT is a bit more uh, hardcore than Persona is in terms of the video games themselves. SMT5 came out, and they did a collab tabletop RPG when SMT5 came out. Uh, that game's a lot more intense than Persona, where Persona is very much more Japanese anime yeah. vibe. Um, we don't play a lot of these specialized tabletop RPGs, but, I mean, obviously a lot of them have been pretty popular with, like, the Elden Ring mm-hmm. RPG and all that kind of stuff. Um I might get it just just for the just lulls. Just to have it. Just to have it. Just to have it. Uh, but the they these these tabletop RPGs in Japan have been very very heavily supported, which is pretty cool. But nothing too crazy there. I just wanted to bring it up because I like Persona. Anyway, it's in our realm of TTRPGs. It is in the realm of TTRPGs, so I have a reason to talk about it more because I love that video game series so heavily. All right, uh, we will end this episode of the Duels and Mana Dorks podcast, episode sixty three of the Duels and Mana Dorks podcast, as we always do, uh, where we take questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and or ideas from the TikTok live chat. Sam is giving me the look that's saying that nobody's really commented anything. There's, there's two questions, and I'm going to kind of melt them down into one. Uh, what do you think of the Fallout sets and the Magic, and uh, the D&D sets from Magic the Gathering? From Magic the Gathering. I think the the Forgotten Realms and the D&D, the D&D Forgotten Realms and the Baldur's Gate sets were very good mm-hmm. Magic sets. Uh, they really captured a lot of the um, the the D and D aspect. Mm-hmm. I think the classes and the backgrounds are some mm-hmm. of my favorite. They're enchant- enchantment types of all. Mm-hmm. Uh, they they're very good and they're also very powerful. Mm-hmm. So if you are getting into magic and you're coming from the D and D perspective and you're like, oh, I can pick up, you can pick up the Forgotten Realms boosters as well as uh, Baldur's Gate boosters for a little bit cheaper than more current magic sets uh, just because they've been out for a very long time and a lot of the cards within are still powerful card mm-hmm. options that are being played to this day um, and even and even a lot of those cards are going to be very valuable if you're into Fallout because one of the backup commanders for the Hail, Hail Kaisar commander deck is uh, the Mr. CEO Mr. House CEO. Mr. House CEO, where it's all about di- where his thing is all about rolling dice and then getting additional benefit just from simply rolling the dice. Mm-hmm. Uh, his formatting bases it off of the D6, but it also triggers on D20s. Yeah. So his abilities get you things when you roll a four or higher and then a six, whereas uh, with the D6, it's like, oh, you know, that's kind of a risky proposition. But <laughs> on a D20, on a D20, I mean, that's you're almost guaranteed it a lot of times. Um, but you're more of the Fallout yeah. person. Um, I like a lot of the Fallout cards. Uh, the um, the Jeskai deck gave a new home mm-hmm. for people who love energy, uh, and the energy token. And and despite the fact that that deck's probably the least powerful of them all, it's probably going to gain the most power from the upcoming Modern Horizons 3 as well, because mm. it looks like there's another deck that's going to have a lot of energy counter synergies with it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, the the uh, Scrappy Survivors was an Equipment and Auras deck. Mm. I don't think... I think that one was interesting, but I think the individual parts of it are cooler. Yeah. Uh, a bunch of those just already fit in fit into strategies that already exist, being... Uh, uh, not aristocrats, the opposite of aristocrats. Yeah. Uh, Voltron. There Voltron we go. strategies. Um, you know, the Caesar deck, it's a pretty standard... Uh, you got a Tokens deck... And then the last one is the uh, introduces a couple new mechanics, being the rad counter mechanic. Um, super cool. I That's like probably it. one of the more powerful ones is the rad counter, just in general. Mill and life drain just constantly for all your opponents. Yeah. So that's that's a fun one. That's it. I was thinking, since we haven't had a lot of questions here recently, um, we would do a little, a little Q&A of our own. So Ooh. I saw a user on TikTok, uh, a Glade plugin. <laughs> That's his username, sure. a good plugin. Sure. Uh, made a couple of videos on 
uh, rules he makes known, kind of meta rules he makes known going into D&D campaigns. Mm -hmm. And I thought we could talk about them just real briefly. Sure. Because so, these are these were controversial, right? Uh, not because I have not I have not read any of these or seen anything about this. Not necessarily controversial, but they did spark a lot of conversation in the uh, in the community. Okay, and I thought it'd be fun for us to talk about since we are in that community. Oh boy! All right, so the first one. Uh, these are across two videos. He gave three examples. Or he gave three rules in each. So let's go. The first one: NPCs in his campaign are non-romanceable. Uh, this. As a side note, uh, backstory romances can be worked in. So if you want your character to have a husband or a wife or something. Uh, and if you choose to go to a brothel, for example, uh, sex scenes are fade to black. I mean, the fade to black makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, it's like we're not we're not the the fucking uh, Brazzers, uh, the Brazzers D and D live stream. You know, no, yeah. Like if that's what it was, then that's probably all that show would be. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like sidebar. That's got to be a great idea, though, right? Is is a is a, a porn studio making a live play D and D show where they just are fucking each other all the time? <laughs> that is, or then they cosplay themselves and then act out the scenes later on, and then like it is. I feel like that's a great idea, but it's a horrible idea, and that's why it's great. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so NPCs being non-romanceable, I think that's fine. That makes, that makes, I mean, yeah. Um, obviously it, it would make most logical sense that the people that you would have the closest and deepest connections to are the ones that are around all the time, which mm -hmm. would be the other people at the table, the people in the party. Yeah. Um, I'm not necessarily, like, I'm not necessarily against romanceable NPCs, particularly in the context of the campaign, because something like, um, called the Netherdeep, mm -hmm. where you have that rival party that is showing up constantly, there's a lot of opportunities for one-on-one -on -one interactions with those NPCs, and they're going to stick with you throughout the entire campaign, I think that could be acceptable. Yeah. as an option as well but I'm, i've got nothing really against that yeah i think it's on the level since you know he's on he was just straight up like on my level i don't feel you know i don't i don't feel the necess the necessity to do romance in D D, and i think that's fine that's perfectly if fine. that's what you want in D D campaign make your own find your own table yeah. find a new table uh the next one there's he has put restrictions on summoning things um this being how many summons he allows you to have in combat uh this is an attempt to reduce combat slog and can be overlooked for experienced players or people with DM experience. Uh, I'm totally fine with that. I also feel like a lot of people just don't really play with summoning spells very mm -hmm. much anymore. I think they're, especially before Tasha's, when they added the um, stat block summoners. Yeah. As opposed to yeah. previously, it was just like, you summon a horde of fairies. <laughs> and it's like, okay, yeah. A horde they, of they cast, they cast, uh, they, they all cast... Um, polymorph on the party you turn turn yourselves into giant t-rexes and then you all are flying giant t-rexes yeah that's not really a thing anymore <laughs> no um but as far as restrictions on abilities i think that is an example that is fine but i can definitely see a player not liking that yeah if they're making that their whole thing that's true that is true um kind of related not knowing an ability equals not being allowed to use it uh, he notes that this is their exceptions for teaching new players. But if you're, say, fifth level and you've been playing since level one and you go into combat and try to cast a spell and go, I don't know what this does, then he'll straight then up say... The spell fizzles. The spell fail. Yeah, you don't use that. If it's like a clarification, though, it's like, oh, yeah, based on the wording, this is what this does, that's fine. But, yeah. I cast darkness because I want it to be dark. Do you understand what you are doing? Nope. Then you don't cast darkness. Then you don't. Then it, it, it fails. I think that's fair. Um, from the perspective of the character, you don't just do something and don't know what the result of it is going to be. Mm -hmm. um, like you can be playing even a wild, like a wild magic sorcerer. Mm -hmm. If you're casting a spell, like the character knows what that spell is. For, for to be able to cast it, a lot of them require material, verbal, somatic components with them so to act to to cast them you need to have some kind of deeper understanding of the spell in the first place so i think i think that's fair i think it also defend not not necessarily defend but helps stray away from the idea of playing a game without knowing the rules basically 
which yeah. is I th- I've definitely had players do that before where it's like basically more or less they don't want to learn the rules or aren't interested in you know not, maybe not as they'll be like oh well I'm playing my character doesn't really know what's going on so you know they just do things by accident if you want that to be the the role play aspect sure but I still expect you to know like for example when you yeah. cast darkness it's magical darkness that you know no light below uh, below a level a spell of third level can penetrate yeah uh, next ancestry and class of the PCs are public knowledge um, in his example, he said that session zero, they all went out and then, uh, or they all introduced their characters and then privately somebody messaged him on discord. Oh, I'm actually doing a changeling thing, but I'm going to tell everybody I'm an elf. I think changeling is like the exception to the rule in that case. Um, I don't necessarily agree. Cause I think it's also just kind of fun to figure out what everyone's playing at the table through gameplay. Mm-hmm. Like, I think I prefer character descriptions, uh, like visual descriptions and just kind of general vibe that you get off of a character. And then you're in combat and one of them casts a spell and you're like, okay, you're a spellcaster. We mm-hmm. know this now. We're brand new introduced people. I wouldn't know that. Yeah. And then you kind of, and then like after a session or two, be like, I'm a fighter and this is my thing, or I'm a bard and this is my thing. And Yeah, I'm kind of in the same boat where. If you're doing it, it, okay, if you're introducing a new party and being like, okay, they've actually been together for several missions now, yeah, then obviously you would all know these things about each other. But yeah, if you want to have that little like, oh, they're, we're brand new, we're all meeting for the first time and kind of figuring each other out, I think that could be fun. But. Yeah, I, I, that's very fun. That's a fun aspect of early session D&D mm-hmm. for me. But yeah, I think part of it also is the reason the player wants to obfuscate. Mm-hmm. So. I mean, a changeling, obviously, I think that that's perfectly reasonable to me uh next pcs have the mental capacity and body of adults um obviously exceptions for child-based settings like if you were playing a goonies campaign he said or uh, ch- uh games for actual children if he was running for 10 year olds um but yeah pcs have the mental capacity and bodies of adults that that just comes into a uh, <laughs> a rule zero discussion of what everyone's comfortable with mm-hmm. in my mind I think I'm on the I'm on the I'm on board with this guy with uh, a Glade yeah. plugin, because yeah. uh, I've seen uh, I used to work at a bar that was a board game bar here in Cincinnati, uh, not like the new one that's opening up here in Cincinnati, which we do need to check out. We do, but um, there was an Adventures League that met, and there was one guy who he played. He's into those animes. Yeah, he played a a a ten year old human female warlock Mm. and i was always a little bit that's uncomfy yeah especially in a a party of adults yeah that i don't like that i already don't like that aspect of a lot of animes where it's like here's this clearly like 11 year old girl but it's okay because she's like four thousand. yeah i don't I don't fuck with that already. That that even more. Nope. I'm I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that rule. Yeah. Uh, and finally, pregnancy equals retirement. Uh, since in his campaigns, NPCs are non-romanceable. Uh, pregnancies are player choice, and it's probably going to be between two PCs. In which case, both parents uh, are. Then he will ask you, "How do you want your characters to retire?" <coughs> Excuse me, I had to cough. You did. I mean, fair. I have never once even considered uh, pregnancy in a D&D campaign, so sure. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, he pointed out to mechanical reasons. Sounds like he might be a father himself or maybe an uncle or something. Um, but the main thing, or the, the thing he, like I said, he pointed out was like, oh, that would probably, you know, that would at least cost two levels of exhaustion in pregnancy. But I'm sure it's there's also deeper things of like, if you get attacked in combat... You know, as a pregnant character, um, there's uh, in a lot of cases there, there's there's swords and arrows and yeah, you might take a shot in an arm. People are gonna aim for your torso, mm-hmm. and half your torso is for a female character or a uterus having character. Your uterus, where you're growing a a, a being, 
So high probability that that gets punctured or cut or sliced open, and then suddenly you don't, you're not pregnant anymore. And that is a whole other can of trauma that I don't want to open up at a table. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's the thing is a lot of uh, a lot of people do try to or do have an expectation of. Uh, working through a lot of real life trauma in D and D games, and actually, we've seen articles where uh, a lot of therapists are using D and D and D and D esque role playing situations to help with uh, to help people work through trauma. But yeah, as as you know, in our case, couple of couple of dudes sitting around a table, and now if someone wanted to make that like a an aspect of their character, that's definitely something that needs to be discussed prior. Mm-hmm. Um, I have nothing against two characters that through the course of campaign fall in love and they decide that they want it to be part of their story that they get pregnant. Mm -hmm. They consensually have a baby. Yes. Um, that seems like a, uh, a a campaign epilogue story to tell more than a campaign campaign sort of campaign. And if you wanted, if you wanted it to be like, oh, you fight the final boss, and like then they realize that one of that one of the characters was pregnant or something. Sure, mm-hmm. but I don't. I'm not. I'm not touching that personally. Yeah, it's, it's, that's something that I don't think is often talked about, and uh, I don't think I'm going to talk about it. But I would be interested to at least survey among people I know, see what their thoughts are yeah. on. Pregnancies yeah. in D and D. That is, that it's. I feel like that's a really niche thing it's in the first place, niche, yeah. right? Um, I mean, there are a lot of women that play D and D, but I don't really. I, I've never really heard of anyone wanting to play a character that then is pregnant during the campaign. Mm-hmm. You know, like it's always the it's always like the epilogue or the postscript of these two characters get together, they have this many kids, whatever. So, I don't know. That's just me. That's just me. So that was some. Uh, those were some notes from a Glade plugin user on TikTok. Uh, but yeah, interesting, interesting. Um, yeah, well, uh, that's an interesting note to end this. The Lord's sixty third episode of the Duels and Manadorks podcast. We are we are inching ever closer, ever closer, ever closer to a very important episode. Approximately six episodes away. Yeah, that'll be a big one. We'll do something big. We'll we'll do a we'll do a browser style live play show. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> where thanks. nothing is fade to black. Oh God. No. Anyway, thanks for play D and D, where nothing is fade to black ever again. Oh, I was about to say something bad. Uh, that's where that's where we're end this episode of the Duels and Mandrakes podcast. You can get the podcast every other week live on TikTok on Tuesdays when we record, or the following day, Wednesday, twelve thirty p.m. Eastern Standard Time on YouTube, Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube Music, podcast services around the globe. Sam, do you have anything you want to say before we depart this land to return in two weeks? Um. Going back to take a little nappy poo. No, I'm actually pretty awake right now. Oh, yeah. Are you in? Are you in a lot of pain? No, not really. Discomfort? A little bit of discomfort. A little, little bloody. Oh boy. Bl- oh, I did. Those were some. Those were some mouth noises. My God. Tasting the blood in my mouth. Yes. But I took some uh, some Tylenol earlier. Actually, I'm hungry still. I'm pretty hungry too. I think it'll be. I think it's about lunchtime. About lunchtime. Yeah. All right. Well, until next time. Peace. <laughs>